My name is Bill Earnshaw. Uh, I'm an American, but I've lived for more than 20 years in Scotland. And so I consider myself to be both American and Scottish. I work in Edinburgh at the University of Edinburgh, and I've been for more than 20 years funded by the Wellcome Trust. I think many of you know that the, that the genetic material that makes us what we are is a molecule called DNA. And DNA is extremely long. So here's one way to think about just how long the DNA is that's inside every single cell. If we would imagine that the cell nucleus was the size of a tennis ball, so that's about 6.7 6 .7 centimeters is the average tennis ball size. The length of DNA in one chromosome, so this is chromosome one of human, would be 40 tennis courts long. So probably 10 times farther than you could even hit a tennis ball. And yet all of that DNA gets packaged into a chromosome that's about, uh, about, about the size of that tennis ball, about the size of the nucleus. And so how does that happen? That's what I'm interested in. And I'm interested in what happens with those chromosomes when cells divide. So one way to think about it is if uh, I have children who, they're grown up now, but they, when they were small children, their rooms were just a pile of clothes. And when we would want to travel somewhere, you, would see, you could look on their bed and there would be this big, huge pile of clothes. And obviously, when you want to go somewhere, you don't just take all the clothes. No, you put the clothes inside a suitcase. And uh, so one way of thinking about what happens when cells divide is they have to take all of this DNA and they put it inside a suitcase so they can move it when the cells divide. Now, the reason you use a suitcase and not a cardboard box it's because it's very awkward to carry a cardboard box around, but a suitcase has a nice handle on it. And chromosomes, when they divide, have a nice handle on them. So the DNA gets packaged and put into the body of this chromosome, and then there's the handle on the chromosome, and that handle is called the kinetochore. And it's a very complicated structure. It has almost 100 proteins that make it up. And my lab was involved in discovering the first of those proteins, and we've, 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 we continue to work on exactly what those proteins are and how they work. So that's one of the things that we work on. Why does the chromosome need a handle? So the chromosome needs a handle because what's going to happen in a, in, in a human cell? We have, 46, we have 46 DNA molecules. That's 46 chromosomes. Before the cell divides, you make two copies of each one. And then you end up with 46, like they're like, imagine them like suitcases, 46 tiny packages. Those line up in the middle of the cell. And then the, at, at, at a point when there is a specific signal given, the two, the two copies of each one separate. And they move to the two, what it's, what's going to be the two daughter cells. If you see a movie of this, it's really fascinating. And you should look online if you haven't seen a movie of chromosomes moving when cells divide. And so when they move to the two poles of the cell, it's the handle that comes first. And the cell builds a structure inside. It's kind of like a scaffolding. It's a very dynamic scaffolding. And that scaffolding attaches to the handle and it pulls it. But the work I'm going to talk about at this meeting considers, it concerns how the DNA gets packaged up inside that chromosome. And that's really fascinating because the first images of chromosomes were taken in 1840. And the first really good images, detailed images that look like what we see now were taken in 1878. And we still don't know how it gets put together. And so that's what my lab has been working on and that's what we're, that's what we're interested in. There's so many great aspects about being a scientist that it's hard, I, I, I can tell you a few. The first one, how would you like a job where nobody tells you what to do. If you can think of something really great and you can convince people to give you money for it, so that's the hard part. You have to convince people to give you the money for it, but there are ways to do that. Then you can do it. And furthermore, you can convince you to give the money to do something, but if in the meantime you come up with an even better idea, in my experience, you just work on even the better idea. Nobody cares if what you do is more interesting than what you said you were gonna do. So you can do whatever, whatever you want. The other thing is that you, you try to think of a really interesting idea but the, the, and, and a problem that might be interesting to solve, but the important thing about science is somebody's got to be able to do it with their hands, right? So you have to have an idea, which is also something you can do with your hands. So that's another great thing. I wanted to be an artist. When I was at university, I would train to be an artist. But I actually find that it's beautiful like art to design ways to answer questions that nobody knows the answer to. That's another thing. 
I'm sorry, you can't be the first person at the North Pole, and you can't be the first person on top of Mount Everest, but you can be the first person to figure out how a chromosome forms, because nobody knows, so you're an explorer. And then I guess the last thing is, here I am in Hyderabad. And guess what? Somebody else paid for me to come here. So I get to travel all around the world, and I give talks, and I meet people, and I tell them what I do, and I learn about the interesting things that people here do, and uh, so I get to explore the world. And I don't make very much money as a scientist, but I don't have to because I can travel. So being a scientist is a great job. <laughs>